why don't you turn with me quickly to the New Testament? Uh, let me just kind of hit these on the fly. Come to Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Let's just quickly talk about the preaching ministry of Christ just for a moment. And to remind you, you're, you, you are aware of this. Nothing that I will say will not be what you do not already know, but to bring to your remembrance in order to underscore its importance. Mark 1, 14. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. Um, shows the centrality and the primacy of the preaching of the word of, of the gospel of God in Christ's ministry. Verse 15, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, believe in the gospel. That's about as straightforward adult speech as you're going to get. Um, verse 16, he was going along by the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon, Andrew casting their nets. Verse 17, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. I think, I think that really is a part of the kind of preaching he was training them to become. They would become evangelistic expositors. They would be gospel-centered, gospel-preaching men whose intent was not just to do word studies on fish, but to become fishers of men. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And if you're not fishing, you're not following. Verse 21. They went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. That's what he does when he hits town. He hits town, he goes to synagogue, he goes in there in a public setting, he takes the word of God and he begins to teach and preach the word of God. Verse 22, they were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. He is quoting scripture, he is reading scripture. Look at verse 38 at the end of this chapter. This has always amazed me. The people were pressing outside his door. They were coming. He said to his disciples, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. I, I, I did not come here for there to be a long line of people wanting to come be healed and talk to me. I have come to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to move on to another town. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And job number one, until he got to the cross, was the proclamation of the word. Verse 39, and he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee preaching. God had only one son and he made him a preacher. I've done a study, and you can easily do it out of Matthew's gospel, expanding on this text, all the cities where he went preaching. I, I, our Lord was on the move. There was no grass growing under his feet. He was going from town to town to town to town, straight forward into the synagogue, preaching the gospel and teaching the word. That, that was our Lord's public ministry. For us not to do this, we would have to break rank with the Lord Jesus Christ and go follow some other pattern for ministry. But this is the pattern of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 5, we read, Jesus saw the crowds. He went up on the mountain and after... He sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. And what he taught them was a sermon, and it was more than just a transfer of information. The end of this sermon makes that abundantly clear. It was a powerful sermon that was preached. All of his teaching was preaching, and his preaching was teaching. He affirms the word of God in Matthew 5, 17 and following. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away and the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished, 
Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom, but whoever keeps and teaches them. Notice the word teach. Whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? It's the one who's teaching and preaching and keeping the word. This is this word-centered emphasis that he is making. Uh, look at verse... 21, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you, and everything that follows, Jesus is now expositing the Old Testament law. He is expounding this commandment, you shall not commit murder. Um, Verse 23, therefore, if you are presenting yourself at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering, etc., etc., etc. All he is doing is expounding that one of the, tenth, of the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit murder. This is a Bible exposition. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Yes, But I say to you, and the conjunctive but there, the idea was the Pharisees in their teaching, it was all the external behavior, but Jesus is now driving for the juggler vein. He is driving for the heart. It begins in the heart. Where is your heart? But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You talk about, verse 29, radical steps of repentance. I mean, Jesus didn't say, if you're having trouble with lust, you men just need to form a little support group and just throw up on each other and talk about your struggles with one another. And then bump chests together. Jesus said, if you're having trouble with, your, with lust, you need to rip out your right eye. And if it progresses beyond just your eye and your hands are involved, you need to chop off your right hand. Get it? Deal with it. It's a very straight message Jesus brought. Don't say, well, we all struggle with this. Verse 29, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And that's where you're going. If you continue down this path, because you're obviously unregenerate. It's not just that you have struggles. You have sin. Verse 30, if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off, throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. And again, that's where you're going. This controls your life because obviously God does not control your life. Now, this is like a lordship salvation message. So, as I, as I look at this whole Sermon on the Mount, I just wrote down this list. Jesus is using figures of speech, negative denial, positive assertion, indicative statements, rhetorical questions, imperative commands, metaphors, analogies, cross-references, scripture references that are cross-references, follow-up explanations, polemic rebuttals, offer of blessing, threats and warnings, gospel invitation, etc., etc. He's playing with a full deck here. And he comes to the end of this in chapter 7, in verse 13, Jesus gives this impassioned, evangelistic plea. Enter by the narrow gate. That is in the imperative mood. That is a command. I am commanding you to leave where you are, to turn from your sin, to turn from the world, and to take a decisive step of faith and come through the narrow gate and leave your baggage on the outside. Leave your lustful eye out. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. How heart-searching is this? 
verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That is lordship salvation. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and your name cast out demons, and your name perform many miracles, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That is not a seeker-sensitive message. That is not an emergent message. That is Jesus preaching. Come to Acts 2 just for a moment. And as you're turning to Acts 2, let me just tell you this. One out of every four verses in the book of Acts is a sermon. One out of every four verses in this historical book is a sermon. There are eight major sermons by Peter. There is one by Stephen, one by James, and nine sermons by Paul. A total of 19 major sermons or defenses of the faith in the book of Acts. Just an observation. What do you think the church should be strong in? The preaching of the Word of God. Come to chapter 2, Acts 2. I think the greatest sermon preached in the church was the first sermon preached in the church. Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. I want you to note this, but Peter taking his stand. Again, there's this authoritative stance. John Calvin writes in his commentary, he had something very serious to say and wanted to be heard. He took his stand with the eleven. This is like Ezra at the Watergate. He's flanked by these eleven on both sides. They put him forward. His histomy is the verb. They, they put him forward. Notice, he raised his voice. He had to be heard. It has a proclamational tone. Uh, someone was asking me during the break, what do I think about conversational preaching? Well, you're going to have to choose one of the two. Either you're going to have conversation or you're going to have preaching, but you're not going to have conversational preaching. He raised his voice and declared to them. And this word declared means to enunciate plainly and to speak forth clearly. He declared to them. Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. When's the last time you heard preaching like that? And give heed to my words. Listen up. Pay attention. Hear me on this. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day, he corrects them. But it is that which is spoken of through the prophet Joel, and he makes a beeline to the text. Now I want you to see what he does here. This is expository preaching. Number one, he reads the text. He reads the text. Beginning in verse 16. This is just like Ezra on, and just like Moses. And what we read, beginning in verse 17, and it shall be in the last days, God says that I will pour out of my Spirit on all mankind. Please note how God-centered this is. Verse 18, even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I in those days pour forth of my Spirit. Verse 19, I will grant wonders in the skies above, the signs in the earth below, etc., etc. Verse 21, and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He has read his text from Joel chapter 2. Read the text. What do we say the next thing is? Explain the text. Read the text. Explain the text. Notice verse 22. He now explains the text. You say, how does he explain the text? He zeroes in on the name of the Lord. 
Everyone, verse 21, who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 22 now exposit, explains, and expounds who is this Lord upon whom they must call. Verse 22, he identifies who the Lord is. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, that's the name of the Lord. A man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst just as you yourselves know. This man, the Lord, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Verse 24, but God raised him up from the dead. And put an end to his, the agony of death, since it is impossible for him to be held in its power. You've read the text. He has explained the text. He has zeroed in on the name of the Lord. And he tells us in 24, 22 to 24, who is the Lord? Now, beginning in verse 25, he supports the text. Read the text. Explain the text. You support the text. You go to cross-references. You go to other places in Scripture. The whole Bible speaks with one voice. The whole Bible lays out one plan of salvation. And to show that what he is saying is not an independent random thought, but that the entire Old Testament speaks with one voice to this, Peter now goes from cross-reference to cross-reference to cross-reference. He supports his explanation of the reading of the text. So, beginning in verse, verse 25, he appeals to Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence. He is at my right hand, so that I may not be shaken. All the way down to verse 29, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And Peter explains Psalm 16 here as referring not to David, but ultimately to a greater son of David, the one whose name is Jesus of Nazareth. He now comes with a second supporting text in verse 30. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath, to seat one of his descendants on his throne. By that, he quotes Psalm 132, verse 11. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did he, his flesh suffer decay. With verse 31, he goes back to Psalm 16. So he is like a carpenter with a hammer and nails, and he is putting nails into the board and driving them home to show from Scripture who the Lord is upon whom they must call. In verse 34, he gives the third text. It is Psalm 110, verse 1. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, in other words, David wrote this, but it certainly is not an autobiographical statement of David. It's not true in his own life. He makes that clear in verse 32. No, David was speaking of someone else. The Lord said to my Lord... Sit at my right hand. Ha! Huh. The Lord said to my Lord. Remember in verse uh, earlier, uh, up in verse um, 21, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. He's now still supporting who this Lord is. This Lord upon whom you must call is the one whom the Lord calls Lord. This is an intertrinitarian conversation. It is God the Father affirming the lordship of his own son, Jesus Christ. It speaks of the, the, the eternality and the equality of the Father and the Son. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, verse 36 is the synthesis of the text. He drawing this together. He's pulling all the lines of what he has said. Read the text, explain the text, support the text. Now, succinctly summarize 
the text. Verse 36, therefore, now we're getting to the therefore. I've given you the information. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him. Who's the him? The name of the Lord upon whom you must call Jesus of Nazareth, the one you put to death, the one God has raised from the dead. Know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus, whom you crucified. Now in verse 37, he applies the text. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. The verb pierced speaks of a butcher's knife being thrust into a sacrificial lamb. They were pierced to the heart. There's only one blade that cuts that deeply. And they said to him, or excuse me, they, they, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, verse 37, and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? They interrupted the sermon. They were under such deep conviction. The sinners are giving the invitation. Tell us, what must we do? We put to death the Son of God? Verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent! Turn from your evil ways. Turn from your unbelief. Turn to the living God. Turn to Christ. And each of you be baptized in the name of of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, meaning because of the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. And with many other words, I mean, it was, it's almost like the sermon was over, but it wasn't. He just kept on preaching after the interruption. With many other words, he solemnly testified. Listen, this wasn't joke night at the church. This wasn't wasn't something funny. This was something serious. Souls were hanging in the balance. He solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, kept on exhorting them. That word exhorting there, urging, pleading, summoning, appealing. Be saved. From this perverse generation. This generation is going to hell. It is a perverse generation. Be saved. Be saved from the wrath of God. Be be saved from eternal damnation. Flee to Christ and be saved. And there were 3,000 souls that day added to the church. What has Peter done? Read the text. Explain the text. Support the text with other scripture. Synthesize, summarize, succinctly, therefore, synthesize the text. And let me tell you, so many times, the difference between a good sermon and a great sermon is to put two or three hours more into that sermon preparation and synthesize what you have said. For this not to be just scattered cross-references and scattered word studies and scattered bits of information, you've got to pull it all together and succinctly state The therefore. All the lines of everything that I've said to you, they now come together, they intersect, they merge at this point. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified. There was no doubt in anyone's mind that day what the synthesis of the text was. 
You may buy into it, you may not buy into it, but you know what the synthesis of the text is, and I leave it at your feet. And then to apply it, repent. And he kept on exhorting them with many words and solemnly testifying to them, be saved from this perverse generation. This is expository preaching. It's text-driven. It's God's exalting. It is Christ-centered. It is spirit-empowered. It is exegetically grounded. It is theologically precise. It is passionately delivered. It is boldly declared. It is evangelistically aimed. It is logically ordered. All ten of those marks of expository preaching are found right here in this text. I wish we had time to go through the rest of the sermons in the book of Acts and just line, line these ducks up in a row. I wish we had time to go through the epistles. We'll leave that for another time. This is the foundations and the fundamentals of expository preaching. I believe with Martin Lloyd-Jones... There is no higher calling in all the world than to be called to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If God is calling you to be a preacher, you have a very high call upon your life. Spurgeon said, if God has called you to be a servant, why stoop to be a king? It is the highest call under heaven. Martin Lloyd-Jones was the great physician in London who worked for the physician who attended to the royal family. Lloyd-Jones' career in medicine was on an astronomical path. He had already distinguished himself as the finest young physician at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, which at that time was the leading hospital in the world. He was wrestling with the call of God upon his life. And he was wrestling with what it would mean for him to leave the medical profession and enter into the ministry. One night, he went to the opera with his wife and the head physician who, was, who saw to the needs of the royal family. It was a tuxedo occasion. They went to the opera, and the entire night, Lloyd-Jones was wrestling in his mind. What will I do with my life? The, the opera is over. And he comes out of this very fancy, affluent building. In his tuxedo and formal attire. And on the corner, there is a little Salvation Army band. A bunch of nobodies. A bunch of misfits in the eyes of the world who are playing their little hymn and there's a soapbox and a man on the soapbox preaching the word of God. And Lloyd-Jones said in that moment He said, those are my people. <clears throat> and he turned his back to fame. And he turned his back to a life of luxury and importance in the eyes of the world. And he said, I will stand with those people. 
they are my people. And with that, in his heart, he entered into the ministry to preach the gospel of Christ. There is no higher calling under heaven than to take the word of God and to study it and to know it and to be proficient in it and to go out into the highways and into the byways and compel people to come to the master's banquet. It has all been prepared. And we are those who are able to bring the good news and to bid them to come. You have all made sacrifices of one kind or another. Whatever it was that you left behind, like Lloyd-Jones left it behind, it's nothing compared to the high call to preach the word of God. People ask Lloyd-Jones, how did you make such a great sacrifice to give up the medical profession to come be a mere preacher? Lloyd-Jones said, that was no sacrifice. That was a humbling honor to be called by God to preach his word. And what a humbling honor has been laid at your feet. I trust in your heart you know what it is that God has called you to. At least in some general way. This isn't just a glorified Bible study. This is men being trained and prepared to go out into the world and to preach the gospel of Christ. I trust you'll be like Ezra and set your heart to study, to teach, and to practice his word. Let us pray. Father, I pray for these men who have come to this school to give their life to the ministry of your word. I understand that all will not preach necessarily exactly in the same way. But many, if not most, will. Lord, raise up from these men preachers like Moses and Ezra and Jesus and Peter. I pray that when they stand to preach, they will lift their voice. They will say, listen to this which is spoken of the prophet Joel. They will speak of this man who has been attested by signs and miracles and delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. I pray they will quote supporting texts and cross-references. They will summarize and they will make their appeal to repent and to be saved from this perverse generation. Put this even yet deeper down in their heart and soul. And may nothing ever remove it. I pray you will bless them. That you will smile upon them. That you will strengthen them. And undergird them. And go before them. And prepare the way. And thrust them out. Into the fields around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.